Hi, thanks for joining me in this lesson where we're going to introduce the concepts of domain-driven design. Now, mind you, this is not a training where we will cover all of the concepts of domain-driven design. That will take ages to complete. However, we will be focusing on the concepts that are especially relevant when designing and building axon-based applications. Domain-driven design has been popularized by Eric Evans as his book appeared in 2003. However, the relevance of domain-driven design today, I would argue, is much higher than it was back in those days. The idea of domain-driven design is that historically, applications were built in a rather monolithic style. And while monolithic in itself is not problematic, very often they lacked certain structure internally that allowed these applications to evolve naturally and to keep on evolving as the business concepts evolved as well. And that ultimately leads to what in domain-driven design is called a big ball of mud. And a big ball of mud is a pattern of software applications or an anti-pattern, if you will, that you can recognize by the fact that it's very difficult to identify the specific structure of your application and rather everything feels connected to everything else. And it's very difficult to make changes to applications that are constructed in such a way or that have evolved in such a way. And the only real thing that you can do is add on to those, uh, to those applications by, by adding rather somewhat external concepts, adding more mud to the size of it. And you might recognize this from some of the uh, projects that you have been working on yourself. I definitely do. So domain-driven design takes an approach where it describes that the domain model is the heart of your software. And that a lot of the technical problems that we face actually originate from a badly designed domain model. Now that in itself is a very interesting concept. Um, and let's explore what all of this means. Now domain-driven design comes with a number of tactical and strategic uh, concepts. We'll be focusing mostly on the tactical ones, but definitely take some time uh, to, to explore the st strategic concepts of uh, domain-driven design, because they do provide a lot of value as well. So let's take a little step back and look at what this domain model really means. Now, every um, it's, it consists of two words, actually, that both have a very explicit definition in domain-driven design. A domain is a sphere of knowledge, influence, or activity. It is the subject area to which the user applies a program. Now, that's a lot of fuzzy wording. But the problem is the concept of a domain is fuzzy. And it is essentially just the environment in which you build your software. You have to realize that there is a lot of knowledge in that area already. There is probably a lot of experience and there are some certain expectations that people working in that domain already have. And it is up to us as software engineers to discover those, um, those expectations and those, uh, the, the uses and those activities and make sure that our software aligns with those expectations. A model is a system of abstractions that describes selected aspects of a domain and can be used to solve problems related to that domain. Obviously, the software that we build needs to solve certain problems. If we have no problems to solve, we might as well not build the software. We need to be identifying those exact problems and make sure that we can find the concepts in the domain that are relevant to us to help solve those problems. Now, they're either relevant because they help us solve the problems, or they are relevant because we need to take care of those while solving the problem. Regulation is an example uh, where uh, there are certain aspects that we might not want to choose, but unfortunately, we have to. Now, a, domain, uh, a model is a system of abstractions. That means we don't care too much about reality. We care about what we really need to solve that specific problem. 
So we should always have the problem in mind when designing a model. Now, if we combine those two words, it essentially means that a domain model in software is the aggregation of all of these concepts that we use in the domain that we can use to solve that particular problem. Right? It will never contain an element that our business clients doesn't care about. Right? If something is not spoken about by the business, we probably don't want to use it in our software. And remember, it's not reality. This is just the model. We're not trying to create a full mirror of exactly what's going on. We're selecting a certain aspect that we care about. Let's have a look at a few examples. Now, a very common example that we've been using for, uh, for a couple of years now is let's have a look at the world. Let's assume that the world is our domain. Now, we can create different models of the world. And we've been doing that for ages. Here's a very common example of a model of our world. Now, this is not what the world looks like, even though we're probably taught in school that this is what the world looks like. We are given the impression that uh, Canada or especially Greenland is a very large country compared to North America, for example. That is not reality. But in a model, reality is not always important. Sometimes we need to care about what the problem is that we're trying to solve. And this particular model was designed to solve the problem of navigating at sea. It has chosen the aspects to keep the borders of, of land and sea intact in such a way that we can draw a line from two points on the border on these uh, on these coasts and the angle of that line gives us the direction in which we need to navigate to get from the origin to the destination in this case the americas have been chosen in the center of the map obviously the world is round and we can choose any location as the center the center in this case has been explicitly chosen because this map helps us to navigate from and to the Americas. Does that make this map right or wrong? No, it doesn't. It just makes it right if you're trying to navigate from or to the Americas by sea. If you're trying to do something else, it is probably the wrong map. Another model of the same world is this ancient map of China. Now, almost all of the area of this map is China. And the little white border around it is a representation of the rest of the world. Is that useful? Yes, it is. Was it useful for people outside of China? Probably not. That doesn't make it right or wrong. It just makes it useful in certain cases. And that's exactly what a model is about, is being useful in specific cases. So now that we know what a model is, let's have a look at some of the building blocks that we can use to construct that model. Now, one of the very common building blocks is the entity. And an entity is an object that is not fundamentally defined by its attributes, but rather by a thread of continuity and identity. Now, let's have a look at what that means. It means, basically, that the attributes do not identify a particular entity. In other words, the attributes can change and we still identify that particular entity as being the same one. For example, I can change my hair, I can change my clothing, that will give me different attributes, but people will still recognize me as me. And it's the same in software. If we identify something by an identifier, if you will, then we can change all of the attributes and still recognize it as the same thing. It has just changed. And that is the thread of continuity that we then have. Opposite of the value object, uh, of the entity, we have the value object. And a value object has no conceptual identity, but is rather fundamentally defined by its attributes. It typically describes the characteristics of a thing and they are immutable. That means that the attributes 
are in fact the identity of the value object. Changing any of those attributes makes us believe that it is a different value object. In other words, if you change something to an object and therefore recognize it as a different object, it is a value object. If you recognize it as the same one, but just different attributes, it will be an entity. Value objects are immutable because identity cannot change. You cannot change the identity of a concept. So if the um, concepts or if the object is identified by its attributes, the attributes cannot change. So let's have a few examples and I want you to try this for yourself. Think about the answer of this question. Is a human being an entity or a value object? Now, unless you are thinking it depends, you're wrong. Because it depends. We cannot, it is not about reality. We are thinking about a real human being in reality. But an entity or a value object is not about mimicking the real world. It is about looking at the specific problem that we are trying to solve. And in certain environments with certain problems, it is probably better to model a human being as an entity. Although in real life, we would never do that. So let's try again. Let's have a look at a 10 euro bill. Is that a value object or an entity? So by now, you should know that the universal answer to all questions related to domain-driven design is always it depends. But it depends on the problem you're trying to solve. And in this particular case, for most of us, any bill in any denomination or currency is a value object because we do not care which bill we get. As long as the denomination and the currency are the same, we consider it the same bill. We can swap out bills with the same denomination and currency and nobody cares. However, there are situations and there are problems that need to be addressed where the identity of every specific bill is important. So in that case, there is an identifier. There is a way to, for us to identify every individual bill as well. If you look carefully at your own bills, you can probably find an identifier on it that uniquely identifies that bill as opposed to any other ones. So let's have a look at a little code example and see what the effects are of choosing an entity over a value object. And in this example, we're going to mix paint. So we've got two buckets of paint. And as the code here shows, we've got one liter of red paint and another bucket containing a liter of white paint. And we construct the buckets using these properties. Now, when we add the liter of white to the liter of red, then what is the outcome? Well, it's a bit of hard to say. Well, for sure we know we will have the liter of red variable to describe an object that now contains two liters of pink. Now that's already a bit awkward. So we've chosen this variable called liter of red, but actually it's two liters of pink. And this code also doesn't really show what happened to the liter of white. If we want to find out, we need to go inside of the code of the add method and find out what really happened there. Or hopefully we have a little bit of javadoc that describes what actually happens. But this code isn't very self-explanatory. And this is exactly an example of how these big balls of mud start. And it's the small cases like this that slowly evolve an application to, uh, to be more uh, difficult to maintain. So let's do the same exercise, but now with value objects. And let's see what happens. So we are going to construct the objects exactly the same way. Right? We have a liter of red, which is a bucket of one liter with the color red and a liter of white with the color white in it. Now, if we want to mix them, we cannot modify any of those objects. The existing objects are value objects. They are immutable. So the only thing we can do is create a new bucket that contains the combination of the previous two. 
So now we need a bucket called lots of pink, or two liters of pink if you like. And it is a liter of red mixed with a liter of white. And note the past tense. So it makes it really clear, and it's almost a readable sentence that is really clear about what we're doing here. So a, a bucket of lots of pink is red mixed with white. That's what we're saying here. Of course, in real life, this doesn't happen. Buckets don't appear out of the middle of nowhere. But I'm going to repeat it again. We do not care about reality. We're trying to solve a problem in software engineering. The advantage of value objects is that we can do all sorts of mathematical operations on them. So we can even use the new bucket that we've created, either lots of pink or the existing liter of red or maybe the liter of white, and mix some more. Right? So we can, do, we can continue this operation uh, on that value object, which makes it very powerful for all sorts of mathematical problems. Now, especially those entities, they need to be remembered somehow. We need to be able to retrieve existing entities in order to execute our operations. And I'm specifically talking about entities in this case because they have mutating states and they have an identity. So that means we need to be very careful which exact instance of an entity that we are going to execute our logic against. The repository is the mechanism that encapsulates the storage, retrieval, and search behavior, and it basically emulates a collection of objects. And that last part of the sentence is important because the repository is not a technical concept. It is a domain concept that describes how do we expect in the domain to be able to find the correct entity. For example, if you're looking up an address of a person, we typically use the last name in a city to find an address. But there might be multiple people in the same city with the same last name, so we use the first names as well. Or maybe to find an individual, we use the birth date combined with your last name. It is much less likely that we will find duplicates. So it's really up to your domain to find out or to describe how to find the right entities. And we develop that or we conceptualize that in a repository. Sometimes entities need to work together and share a, a common state together or be in a consistent state as they change their life cycle. That's what the aggregate does. An aggregate is a group of associated objects which are considered as one unit with regard to data changes. That means changing any one of those entities, we consider a, an aggregate to change states. And we want to make sure that there are certain invariants within that aggregate that are maintained at all times. To make sure that that happens in a correct way, we need to make sure that external references are restricted to one member of the aggregate designated as the root, also known as the aggregate root. And the aggregate root is essentially responsible for maintaining a set of consistency rules within the aggregate's boundaries. In other words, all communication goes through the aggregate root, and it is its responsibility to delegate those activities to the entities or value objects within the aggregates. So let's try that. Let's have a look at a little example here. I'll briefly describe the example. And what I would like to know from you is where do you think the boundaries are of the aggregates here? So we have a passenger, and a passenger has a planned itinerary. And an itinerary consists of a number of legs. You can imagine a lag is a single flight from some origin to some destination, and the combination of flights gets the passenger to its, its origin and destination. And every leg is operated by a certain flight. Now, there's basically three possible answers here. So either one aggregate is the passenger, and the other aggregates consist of flight, itinerary, and leg, or passenger and itinerary together, and leg and flight on the other side, 
or its passenger itinerary and leg together and the flight on its own. What do you think? It depends, remember? What is the problem that we're trying to solve? So this is our answer, but the answer is only sensible if you know what problem we're trying to solve. And in this particular example, we're managing delayed flights and changes of itineraries to accommodate the passenger to board a new flight to make sure that the passenger still gets to its itinerary, uh, to its destination. So there's an invariance that for a passenger, we always want an itinerary associated with that passenger that will actually get the passenger to its destination. So we will never want to have a passenger with destination X that brings that is associated with an itinerary that brings it to destination Y. However, flights get delayed. And that means that as a flight is delayed, an itinerary might not be able to be executed on anymore. Right? We might not be able to get the passenger to his destination through that itinerary because he's missing the next flight. However, when a flight is delayed, recalculating a new itinerary, there are two separate operations. There's no invariance that says when a flight is delayed, all passengers must immediately as the delay is recorded, be updated. That is something that can be executed asynchronously. And that's how we make the decisions of choosing these aggregate boundaries. Another concept in domain-driven design is the event. Not described in the original blue book, but identified a couple of years later as event-driven architectures became more popular. And an event is definitely a concept that is very important within domains. And basically an event is an object that is, that is a notification that something relevant has happened inside the domain. So it is a business concept. They are not technical concepts, but rather the technical message describes something that happened in our domain. It is a way to model the things that happen. Now with those building blocks, we can add structure to our model. We can provide components and we can designate certain behavior to those components and how they interact with other components. However, this will still give us one big model where everything seems to be connected with everything, either directly or indirectly. And there's one strategic concepts of domain-driven design that I would really want to dive into, which is the bounded context. There is no formal definition of a bounded context, but there is a rather large description of it uh, that you can find in, uh, in Evan's book, although also in other literature. But let's dissect that, uh, that sentence. And basically, a bounded context is about defining your model first. Define that model and make sure you describe the concepts that are important to you. However, when doing that, you need to define boundaries of that model. Where is it useful? Where can it be applied? But more importantly, where should it not be applied? Which problems are you explicitly not trying to solve? And by doing that, you get more focus in the model and you will make it more maintainable. Make sure that a model is very consistent. And I'm not talking about data consistency. I'm talking about conceptual consistency. Make sure that every word you use has a very clear and concise meaning. And make sure you don't get distracted by concepts or meanings of concepts outside of the boundaries of that model. Let's go for an example. We go back to our flight. Now, some of you might have been on a flight before. If you haven't, you can imagine that if you're on a flight, there's a lot of people involved with carrying out a flight. There's passengers, there's ground crew, there's cabin crew, and probably many more. These different people have a different way to look at a flight. For example, the passenger mainly cares about the flight number. When do I need to check in? 
where do I need to be, and how much luggage can I bring. Those are things that a passenger will typically care about in a flight. The ground crew will look at a flight, probably using the same flight number, but they care mostly about the arrival time of the flight. And mind you, that is not your arrival time. It is the arrival time at which the flight arrives at your airport. And they probably care about the turnaround time. When it arrives, how much time do we have to prepare that plane for the next flight? And the cabin crew, they probably care about, again, the flight number. They might care about who are my crewmates? Who are the people that I need to work with? And what is the service schedule? Do we serve breakfast? Do we serve lunch? Do we serve dinner? What kind of dinner? What kind of drinks? Etc. Etc. So these are all different concepts that all are related to a flight. And what we should be very careful about is to not put all of those concepts inside the same entity of a flight. We're solving several different problems and we need to identify our bounded context and say, okay, for this flight, we're looking at a passenger. And we, I, we model the aspects that a passenger cares about and will not model the concept that the ground crew were, uh, cares about. Because the word uh, arrival time means different things to a passenger than to ground crew. And that distraction, as soon as you get that distraction inside of your model, a big ball of mud is being created. So these concepts allow us to give structure to the model. And I do admit in slides that is very easy to show. You just add a bit of color to the model and then you're done. But there's a lot more to it. But we'll explore that in another session.